Hi everyone, my name is Hannah. I'm the Senior Outreach Officer here at St Anne's College and I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you today about outreach and access at St Anne's, the work that we do, um, and maybe give a bit of a, a clearer overview of what outreach and access at Oxford actually is, what form it takes, why it's so important, but also how we've responded to working from home and how we're continuing our outreach and access work in spite of the current pandemic. So just to introduce you to the team, there are two permanent members of outreach staff here at St Anne's. Uh, there's my colleague Jessie and myself, and we're both past students of Oxford. Jessie studied music at St Hughes and graduated last year and is currently completing a master's degree in education research methods. And I studied at Balliol uh, and graduated back in 2013. And I went on to work in a sick form in Southwark for about five and a half years, uh, where I did a lot of work supporting students from the local community uh, in their applications to university, apprenticeships, to Oxford and Cambridge, and to lots of other places as well. Uh, and together we bring a lot of experience of working with students of all different ages. Jessie's done a lot of work on programmes like Unique, has been a student ambassador and has been involved in programmes like the Brilliant Club and Sutton Trust. And I've done a lot of work from the school side as well. So together we bring quite a lot of experience working with young people, um, getting them enthusiastic about education. And we're both really pleased to be working here at St Anne's. One thing that's important to point out about how Oxford does their outreach and access work is that all colleges are linked with regions across the UK and that is in order to ensure a fair spread of resources uh, but also so that colleges aren't putting all of their work into one particular region uh, rather than uh, sharing them fairly out across all regions. So the regions that St Anne's predominantly works with are Hillingdon and Southwark in London and also in the northeast of England. So our link regions there are Gateshead, Newcastle, uh, Northumberland, North Tyneside, South Tyneside and Sunderland. And as you can imagine, uh, having that work in two very different areas of the UK brings its own problems and also its own exciting challenges as well. Uh, but one simple issue is the fact that uh, the northeast of England is geographically distant. So that means that we will spend entire weeks of our year uh, travelling up to the northeast to make sure that we're able to meet with schools and with students and to give them clear and accurate information about Oxford and about applying to Oxford. That doesn't mean that we can't work outside of our link regions though. So some of the work that we do might be with charities um, and education organisations outside of our link regions. Uh, or with some links to our link regions. And we might also work with other colleges on other activities um, or uh, in areas where we've got existing contacts. However, the main bulk of our work is done in those regionalization link regions. And if you want to find out more about those, uh, have a look at the link in the slide and that'll give you more information about which colleges are linked with which regions. So I keep mentioning the words outreach and access, but what do those words actually mean and what do they encompass? So really outreach is kind of an umbrella term that covers lots of different things. One of those things is widening participation. So that is uh, providing advice and guidance and information to younger students. And some of those might be in say year six through to year eight. So from say ages 10 to 13 um, about and that's information about university in general, not necessarily specifically about Oxford, um, but getting students interested in university and thinking about that as a genuine option for them in the future. And under widening participation, we often mean those groups that are underrepresented at university at the moment. So that might be from a, partic from a particular region. So that includes in particular the northeast of England. Um, that can also include students from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. That can be students who have had uh, personal disadvantages, such as they've had free school meals or their first generation to go to university as well. And that brings us on to widening access. So that is students who are currently underrepresented at universities and particularly competitive universities. 
um, and encouraging them to make a successful application. And then the final method of working with prospective applicants is recruitment. So that is working with um, prospective applicants regardless of background. So regardless of whether they are state school or whether um, they are privately educated, but giving, making sure that they have all the information that they need in order to make a fully informed application to a place like Oxford. More recently is something slightly out of the umbrella and that is in reach. So that is working with your current students at university. Um, that can be getting them to engage perhaps as student ambassadors and ties in quite nicely with the aims of widening participation and widening access. But also that is ensuring that students who have come to university under that sort of widening access label are still able to make a successful transition to university and that they are fully supported whilst they're at university as well. Hello, my name is Jessie and I work as an outreach officer at St Anne's College um, and I'm also doing a master's at the University of Oxford at the moment in educational research methods. Now my master's is actually focusing on one of the St Anne's College outreach projects, Aim for Oxford, um, but I'm also looking at why it's really important that we do outreach work and who we do outreach work with. Now, to start with, the one really important reason why it's so integral to St Anne's College is because it's an important part of the ethos of the college. The college is known for being forward thinking and outward looking and strives itself for having a radical tradition of uh, widening access to Oxford education for those who could not access it before. Starting as the Society of Homes, Oxford Home Students in 1879, it enabled women in the UK and many other countries to attend the university in a unique way that they couldn't before, which was a lot more flexible and affordable than others women's halls. Now, that tradition, uh, starting with women in the 1870s, has extended to today, which now we're looking to improve our way of ensuring that students from a wide variety of backgrounds are able to access St Anne's College and it's open to all who would do well here. Inequality in accessing higher education isn't just across school type, in fact it goes a lot uh, deeper than that and goes across different ethnicities, different classes, uh, those who are among the first generation of their family to go to university, but then also really importantly for St Anne's College uh, is there's a lot of regional inequality in access to uh, Russell Group and specifically Oxbridge Education. Now this is important for St Anne's given our work centres really in the northeast of England, which is the most underrepresented region at Oxford. Now you can see on the left hand side there the map which shows that there are 910 students uh, who achieve AAA or better at A level from the northeast of England each year and that is the minimum entry requirement for uh, to gain entry into the University of Oxford. So they make up 5.6% of all students who achieve AAA or better at A level across the UK. However, they only make up 2.4% of students at the University of Oxford. So there's a significant more amount of work to be done to ensure that our regional access, that we're getting the best talent from the northeast of England and that our work really centres on ensuring that the barriers that these students have in accessing higher education, that we as an institution work to break down those barriers to enable access. The University's Access and Participation Plan, which refers to UK students, uh, in line with the objectives set by the Office for Students, reflects the university's desire to encourage applicants of all backgrounds. After all, how can we claim to be the best university if we aren't accepting the best students? One of those targets involves terms that you might have heard previously in uh, regarding access and outreach, which are ACORN and POLA. So these are, these are students from postcodes that are judged to be socio-economically disadvantaged. So these are ACORN categories four and five, and those from areas less likely to progress to higher education, which are polar quintiles one and two. The two tables on the left are taken from the uh, Oxford's admissions statistical report from last year. 
Looking at the Oxford record of accepting students from these backgrounds of relative disadvantage, we can see that Oxford is making positive change in its student body and that St Anne's is broadly in line with or ahead of those figures. However, the graphs on the right come from Oxford's Access and Participation Plan, and those targets reflect the gap in participation rates between those from the most advantaged backgrounds. So in this case, that would be ACORN uh, categories one and two, and polar, polar categories uh, four and five. And that those students from the most, most advantaged backgrounds have a clear gap in those participating in higher education compared to those from the least advantaged backgrounds. It's this gap which can be down to quite a wide variety of factors such as personal disadvantage, uh, prior school attainment or the region that you're from uh, that we're particularly interested in. That's especially as only around 4% of students from polar, polar quintile one uh, backgrounds only 4% of those school leavers achieve three A's at A level, so Oxford's minimum offer. But again, only around 30% of those students actually make an, currently make an application to Oxford. So this is why our targets and outreach and access activities show a commitment to narrowing that gap between the most advantaged and the least advantaged at Oxford. That's also why that it's so important that our outreach work and activities cover the whole time that a student is at school, not just their final years, as by that point it might actually be too late to make a significant difference to their overall uh, school attainment. There's a lot more that the university can and is doing in order to address this uh, socioeconomic disadvantage, as well as other things uh, such as particular stu student groups that are currently underrepresented at the university. And later on in this video, I'll mention some of the things that St Anne's is doing specifically in order to address this. So you've heard about why we do things, uh, but it's also important to know what we actually do, what our actual actions are. So between 2018 and 19, the college organized and delivered 127 different outreach events and activities. And they covered about 3,300 students from 170 UK schools or colleges. So some of those would have been in our link regions in the northeast and London, but also through our work with organisations like the Brilliant Club and into university. That also would have been students from, say, the Oxfordshire or the Midlands regions as well. Our activity is primarily focused on state schools, and we target schools then and different groups of students based on. Uh, things such as proportion of free school meals, GCSE attainment, and a variety of other personal factors as well. So our outreach activities take a couple of different forms. Uh, the main ones of those are inbound visits, so visits from schools, groups of students or education charities to the college and to Oxford, and outbound visits, which is uh, tends to be the outreach officers and maybe some student ambassadors or tutors going to particular regions that we work with. So those inbound visits might take a couple of different forms. Um, the picture in the top left is of a discovery day that we run. So that is uh, students in year 10, so about sort of 15, 16 year olds, uh, will come to the college. They'll get a talk from the outreach officer about what university actually is all about and how Oxford is slightly different. Uh, they'll get a chance to have a chat with some student ambassadors, a lunch in college, uh, testing out the delicious hall food. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we'll take a trip to a uh, museum or other activity so they can see uh, something else uh, alongside their visit to Oxford. We also run similar visits for students in year 12. So students who are about sort of 17, uh, 16, 17, considering making an application to the university. And these are again from schools in our link regions and uh, alongside meeting student ambassadors, they'd also get an academic taster session, which is often run by a graduate or by one of our tutors. We also run some slightly more bespoke events. So these might be for a particular charity. So we've had groups um, on Saturdays from organisations like Generating Genius or the Caribbean STEM Coaching Club. We've also had visits from groups from Into University 
and we also host uh, larger visits from organisations like the Brilliant Club who come and visit us regularly through the year. And they use the college then as a base for some of their activities and their programme of events, but also get more information about uh, Oxford University and how Oxford can be different to other universities as well. Based on the age of those students, you might be right in thinking that a lot of those activities are based around uh, widening access, but we also enjoy running widening participation activities. So, for example, we've hosted a number of primary school visits and they have been a lot of fun. Uh, the students ask some fantastic questions and completely unfiltered questions as well. And we've run tours then of the college or of other colleges around Oxford, uh, given them some taster days. So uh, when you imagine 30 year sixes sitting in a room learning about uh, DNA or about classical mythology, uh, they have a lot of fun doing those kinds of things. And we really enjoy hosting groups like that. So we have a lot of inbound visits throughout the year and sometimes there'll be peak times or slightly quiet times. But it's really fun welcoming them to the college, showing them what uh, Oxford is like and what St Anne's is like, and also giving them the chance to actually meet some current students, which is really important. In addition, we'll also run inbound residentials to the college. And the main one of those is the Northeast Residential, which is for students from across the Northeast that we run jointly with Christchurch and Trinity Colleges and with Lincoln College supporting. Uh, as part of the Northeast Consortium. So that is the three colleges that work in the Northeast of England hosting students and giving them a really fantastic time around the July open days. So it's a great chance for them to have a visit to Oxford and particularly for some of them, the distance or the cost of traveling to Oxford can be prohibitive. So it's really important that we're able to run events like that, particularly for our more distant regions. Outbound visits tend to take the form of trips and visits from the outreach officers and student ambassadors to schools in our link regions. So we run talks then for students from year seven to about year 13. They can be on anything from exploring university, exploring Oxford University, running some taster sessions about different subject areas, admissions test workshops and interview workshops as well. We've also run a number of parent information sessions and teacher training sessions in our link regions as well. We'll also get involved in UCAS fairs. So when lots of universities all gather together and students go around and pick up prospectuses and find out more information and the Oxford and Cambridge student conferences as well, which are a great way for prospective applicants to find out more about applying to Oxford. So our student ambassadors play a huge part in all of those activities as well. So whether that is uh, giving a tour of the college, uh, explaining more about their subject, but also they get involved in uh, the interview period. So they are so important in making people feel welcome and at home and to show just how friendly and welcoming a place like St Anne's is. Hi, I'm Jenna and I'm this year's JCR Access Rep and I'd like to speak to you a bit about the work that the JCR does in terms of our access and outreach aims. Um, firstly, we do a lot of college tours. I feel like it's very beneficial having student ambassadors deliver these because the students that speak to us often have a lot of questions that I think they wouldn't feel as comfortable asking um, perhaps a member of staff, you know, I think they have a lot of questions about student life as well as um, the accommodation or the library and I think it's just much more engaging for them to see students who care about college and care about their education so much in enough to want them to join us at St Anne's as well. Um, also college open days provide a really good opportunity to speak to um, student ambassadors and I think Having people who personally experience the courses is really insightful because they can ask questions that the academic staff can't really answer in, in terms of like, you know, perhaps workloads and how they manage them, how they go about their day to day um, student activities. And whilst the academic office is really informative, um, it's often hard to grasp the individual aspect of student life for all subjects. Interview helping provides a really, really important role of making sure that each student feels welcome at St Anne's 
and I think I've spoken to a lot of students who have got in and spoken to us as ambassadors and been thanked personally for the work that we do, making them feel comfortable. I don't think this role could really be um, delivered by anyone other than student ambassadors because we really do understand what it's like to be put under, you know, the pressure of interviews. So I think we're the best to sort of help calm nerves and it's a really rewarding experience for us too. Um, over the term, whilst we were at St Anne's, we were filming videos to be put on our JCR, the JCR section of the website, as well as on our YouTube channel. And I think that's really helpful in showing um, student life at St Anne's, as well as what we enjoy about our subjects, what we enjoy about the university and what we did for ourselves that we'd recommend to someone else um, from an applications perspective. So things that we've read that really helped us understand something or a documentary that we watched and we've made sure that they're all really accessible to the vast majority of people. So one of the things that we've been able to launch this year in order to combat socio-educational disadvantage in the northeast of England, as well as going some way to address the fact that students from the northeast of England are underrepresented at Oxford University, is our Aim for Oxford programme. So this is a donor funded programme uh, that was launched in September and that is for students in year 12, so 16 to 17 year olds from state schools from the northeast of England. It's also a sustained outreach programme, which means that it will be running for uh, most of those students for two years. So through to the end of year 13, after they've made their university application. And the whole purpose is to support uh, very capable young people in making a strong application to the University of So we run Aim for Oxford in collaboration with Christchurch College, who also works in the northeast of England. And rather than just being a single talk or one off activity, it is a series of activities throughout year 12. So uh, in their students first year of sixth form in order to help them consider different courses at university, but also to give them clear and accurate information about making an application to Oxford. So, for example, we've run workshops on personal statements. We've run some workshops on super curricular activities and we'll also be running activities based around admissions tests. In our first year, we had 40 places on the programme and received nearly 170 applications from the northeast of England, which is an incredible response. We selected students then based on factors of disadvantage, so particularly taking into account students who have ever been in care, who have been young carers themselves, who have ever had free school meals or who are first generation to university, as well as those from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. It's also one of the things that we've had to adapt quite quickly to uh, remote working as well. So under normal circumstances, we would have run a series of academic taster sessions and workshops up in the northeast of England uh, from January through to April, one per month and then invited students to a residential in August in Oxford and given them four days living in college, uh, showing them around the university, helping them to work on a particular project um, and supporting then a very academic application to Oxford. So before lockdown happened, we managed to run uh, an event in January and again in February, but unfortunately we're, we weren't able to run our March and April events. However, alongside Christchurch, we very quickly moved these online. So we've run a couple of academic taster sessions that our tutors have offered using uh, platforms such as Teams and Microsoft Teams and Zoom. We've also run our personal statement workshop through uh, Microsoft Teams as well. In some ways, the lockdown has actually improved the programme as it means that we've been able to con continue having contact with students even after the end of the planned first part of the programme. And it also means that we've been able to adapt dates and times to fit in with their timetables. So some of them might be working from home, some of them might be children of key workers and have been in school, others uh, might have part time jobs that they're doing throughout the day. So it's really important that we're able to continue being flexible with this programme so that we can best support students from the northeast to make that competitive application to Oxford. 
At the moment, it seems really unlikely that we'll be able to run the planned residential in August. Uh, so instead, we're looking at a digital residential, which is quite interesting, putting together different ideas for how that can work, but also to ensure that we're not asking students to be locked to their computer or their device all day long, because that's one, it's not just possible. It's just not possible for students to do that. But also some of the students that we're working with, particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds, might not have access to their own device. They might not have access to a computer for a whole period of the day, um, or they might be sharing it with a sibling or another member of their household. So these are all things that we have to take into consideration when adapting our plans uh, for the pandemic. Now, access to Oxford and universities more generally has been really important work as part of the, the college has been taking part of uh, in a long history, but also especially in recent years. But there's still significantly more to be done. And perhaps now, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's even more important that we continue this work than before. Students from the most disadvantaged backgrounds are being more affected uh, their education is being more affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Whether that's access to uh, devices in order to enable online learning, or simply, as we can see in this graph here, whether they're able to access uh, school content at all. So, as we can see, there is a distinct difference between the number of privately educated students and state educated students who are able, uh, who are currently accessing regular work from their teachers. with uh, state funded students more likely to not be receiving work than private school students and private school students more likely to uh, be receiving regular feedback and work from their teachers than state school students. However, access inequality goes beyond more than just school type and again, as it was mentioned, the most disadvantaged students are those that are being most adversely affected by the pandemic. As we can see here, another graph by the Sutton Trust, it shows that the uh, proportion of students according to uh, school free school meal eligibility who currently have access to an electronic device for learning. So schools in uh, FSM Q1, the first quintile of free school meal eligibility, are those who are most affluent, uh, have the lowest proportion of students who are currently eligible for free school meals or those in quintile five are in the most deprived schools. Now, as we can see, the graph distinctly shows that uh, students from the most deprived schools are more like, and then more students from the most deprived schools have less access to a tablet or a laptop or some other electronic device for learning. Now, this is not only going to be significantly affecting them now, but also in future years. And it's the work of St Anne's College, the University of Oxford and the higher education sector and education sector in uh, total that need to work to reduce the inequality and the impact uh, of this pandemic on students' education, especially those from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. And that's why it's really important that we continue our access work now and adapt it in light of the pandemic to ensure that we are still reaching students from the most disadvantaged backgrounds who could do well at St Anne's College. Given the current, current COVID-19 situation, we've also been doing a lot of remote access work. So this comes in the form of our um, Twitter series, which, it, wherein students teach a subject in two to three minutes of something they're currently learning. And the JCR thought would be a really good way of showing that learning keeps on going during lockdown. We intend to do college Instagram takeovers, which we've had many meetings about to show days in the lives of Oxford students, even when we're away from Oxford. And we really want to continue giving tours to students virtually so that they have a means of um, seeing college from a student perspective. So the move to working from home following the lockdown in the UK has also made things a lot more challenging um, and definitely kept us on our toes. As you might imagine, a huge amount of our outreach and access work uh, relies on face to face contact, whether that is school groups coming into the college or members of the college going out to schools. All of that involves travel and all of that involves seeing people face to face. So it has been a huge and quite an interesting challenge moving that online and trying to find ways of replicating the same level of interaction that we would normally have in a classroom setting, for example. 
So one of the first things that we did following the lockdown was make some significant changes to the outreach and access areas of the website. And you can see the link for that at the bottom of the slide. I would really encourage you to have a look at it um, and to also share this link with your friends, share this link with uh, people with young children or people, uh, ch students who are considering applying to university, as we do really want uh, people to be making the most of it as well. So we added a number of pages to the website that include links to online resources that students can use when studying from home or that parents or teachers can use in order to support um, homeschooling. Right at the point where we moved to remote working as well, luckily our student ambassadors had been recording a series of videos for us about life at St Anne's, about Oxford and about their experience of their different subjects. So with a bit of tweaking and some quick editing from our ambassadors, it meant that these videos were ready to go live on the website not long after we started working from home. The next step was then uh, to ensure that we were still able to have contact with the schools in our link regions, that especially the ones that we literally planned to visit the week that we moved to working from home. So we took all of our standard presentations, we had another look at them, and we thought, well, how can we ensure that these stay interactive? Because otherwise it's just talk us talking uh, to a blank screen, uh, as we can't see student faces uh, due to safeguarding reasons. Uh, otherwise, it's just us talking to a blank screen for an hour, which is boring for them and also slightly scary for us. So luckily, we found a tool called Slido, uh, which we've built into our presentations, and that gives us chance to uh, put in interactive activities, uh, anonymous question and answer sessions, uh, polls, quizzes and idea sharing as well. And that means that we've taken a little bit of the interaction and put that back into our online activities. We've also been able to set up online activities like a prospectus hunt as well, so that students uh, have a look at the Oxford website and they find information about courses that they're interested in and follow a few questions and answers there. We've also been really lucky about how quickly our academics have adapted to working online. So that means that we were able to run, for example, our Aim for Oxford taster sessions, um, and we we're able to run on one, uh, for example, on uh, biomedical sciences and neuroscience. Our student ambassadors have also been fantastic about adapting to working from home and also showing their enthusiasm and their genuine involvement and commitment to outreach work. So in one of the photos on your screen, you can see uh, a group of ambassadors who joined in with a question, a live question and answer session with a school group that we had recently. And they've also been recording a series of videos that we've called St Anne's Shorts, which uh, shows what they've been learning about in their undergraduate degree and also gives a little glimpse into their home because they are also having to make that adjustment to working from home as well. Most recently, we also ran an online offer holder event. So uh, it's also quite unnerving, I imagine, for a lot of the students who currently hold offers for the University of Oxford and for St Anne's College, um, as they don't quite know what to expect when they come to the university in September, October. And for a lot of them as well, uh, they don't know what their grades will be because it's no longer determined by an examination. Uh, it's determined by teacher predictions. So we were really pleased to be able to run something online that 90 of our offer holders were able to come and attend um, and answer their questions, whether they are general questions about living at college or finances or subject specific questions, but also questions considering the amount of uncertainty around the pandemic at the moment and what that will mean for their teaching and their learning in October uh, when they come to the university. So it has been a massive learning curve adapting to all these different online ways of working, but it's also been a lot of fun as well. And some of these activities, it's worth remembering, are actually worth continuing with past lockdown. In theory, this means that we can actually have more and continued contact, particularly with our geographically distant link regions, as we're able to run more online events and it doesn't involve having to travel up every time. However, it is no replacement for face to face contact. However, a massive concern for us, and especially if we're all going to be continuing uh, working from home for a lot longer, is what about our most disadvantaged students? 
So these are students who might have the academic ability and have shown the academic progression to make a really exciting, a strong application to Oxford. But for whatever reason, and often they are socioeconomic reasons, for example, might not have access to the Internet at home. All of these activities, no matter how accessible we make them, if the hardware isn't actually in place to support those students, then how are they actually going to access these activities? Likewise, we have uh, massive concerns about how we're able to continue interacting with schools. We know that some schools have really struggled with moving to online teaching or haven't been able to do this for every year group. And particularly in those schools where only a couple of students or even one student might consider an applying to Oxford or Cambridge in a year, um, they are quite honestly just not going to be a priority when teachers are struggling to make sure that students are continuing to learn. So although we have a lot of the infrastructure in place now in order to ensure that we can successfully run our activities and to ensure that we're still reaching out to students and to schools, we do have some wider concerns about what this means for access. So these are just some of the big questions that we need to be asking ourselves at this stage, but also reflecting on our practice and what changes we can make so that we are as inclusive as possible. So I hope this has given you a good overview of the kinds of activities that we do under normal circumstances, but also how we've moved to working online um, and the kind of outreach and access work that we do here at St Anne's. I hope it's also given you an idea of why it's really important that we're able to continue doing this work and that speaking with students and prospective applicants and sharing accurate information can actually make a genuine difference to whether someone chooses to apply to Oxford or doesn't choose to apply. If you've got any questions or would like to share any thoughts about what we've spoken about, then please do get in contact. We'd love to hear from you. And in the meantime, uh, thank you very much to Jesse and to Jenna for their contributions to this video. And I hope you and your families are keep staying well and keeping safe.